Section 36 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 36. J. Walter Elliott. I was born in South Hanover, Indiana, March 22, 1833, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Lafayette, Indiana, April 18, 1861, in Company E, 10th Regiment Indiana Volunteer Infantry, and promoted as captain in Company F, 44th Regiment, United States Colored Troops, in July 1864 was captured near Nashville, Tennessee, December 2, 1864, and confined in the Cahaba, Alabama, and Andersonville, Georgia prisons. I have seen death's carnival in the yellow fever and the cholera-stricken city, on the ensanguined field, in hospital and prison, and on the rail. I have, with wife and children clinging in terror to my knees, wrestled with the midnight cyclone, but the most horrible of all were the sights and sounds of that hour. The prayers, shrieks, and groans of strong men and helpless women and children are still ringing in my ears, and the remembrance makes me shudder. The sight of two thousand ghostly pallid faces upturned in the chilling waters of the Mississippi as I look down on them from the boat is a picture that haunts me in my dreams but to the narrative where shall i begin memory with faultless faithfulness reproduces a thousand pictures of the dark days of the winter of eighteen sixty four and sixty five captured and paroled in october ordered on duty without exchange and again captured while trying to steal through hood's lines at nashville on december second eighteen sixty four I knew full well that a recognition would be swiftly followed by a drumhead court-martial and my execution. Therefore I assumed the name and command of one Captain David E. Elliott, of Company E, 75th Indiana, who I knew was with Sherman on his march to the sea, and never until I had shaken the dust of the Confederacy from my feet did I disclose my identity to friend or foe and the sixty autograph albums gotten up by my companions in castle reed will attest it shall i tell of the march over ice and snow the wading of deep streams from nashville to dixon two miles below cherokee on the memphis and charleston railroad the suffering from cold and exposure in the dead of winter and from hunger when i bought a barrel of corn meal for thirty-two dollars in greenbacks and then eating not half what i craved but dividing with my fellows of seeing a wagon load of corn on the ear driven into the prison corral and thrown out to us as though we were a lot of fattening hogs of the number of dead we left on the ground next morning killed by eating raw corn after a four days fast of my confinement without food for a day and night in a close crowded box car in which fresh horse dung was half a foot deep of the indignities the humiliations and cruelties heaped upon us by cowards playing provost marshal of our sojourn at cahaba alabama of our removal from that purgatory to that hell of hells at andersonville presided over and approved upon daily by his satanic majesty's most loyal representative on earth captain words ably assisted by his brothers of royal blood who were kenneled fed and guarded by one of the c s a s most trusted lieutenants with a picked command scarcely second to the historic old guard oh the long and dreary winter in prison the suffering from cold hunger and the petty tyranny of cowards clothed with a little brief authority the stench of rotten meat of which we had not half enough to eat the bitter bitter feeling that our country had abandoned us to our fate refusing to exchange because it would be exchanging able-bodied soldiers for us who were starved until we could be of no service how day by day through long weary weeks each of us watched his fellows slowly but surely starving to death and already mourned as dead by fond loved ones at home 
get ready for exchange came the order oh the joyous shout that made the castle walls ring out how each of us laughed and cried shook hands with and hugged his fellows and joining hands in a circle in good old methodist camp meeting altar style as we all joined in singing rally round the flag boys the joy of that good hour more than repaid for all past tribulations sixty-five officers formed in line awaiting orders behold death on a pale horse says that grand old soldier general noble of bridgeport connecticut as captain wurz enters the stockade on a white pony at the cars we joined some five hundred privates from the stockade and a more pitiable sight city life in its worst phases never disclosed all were begrimed and blackened by exposure without a pretense of protection from summer's sun or winter's rain all weak and lean from starvation many too feeble to take care of themselves were literally encased in scales beneath which were myriads of living vermin eating all vitality away two i saw doubled up and scarred all over having been literally torn in pieces by the dogs because they attempted to escape from the devil's domain we left a good many poor fellows dead along our entire route thrice derailed twice we had two cars wrecked crippling a good number of the boys on march twenty sixth we hailed the glorious flag of our country as it floated on the breeze tears flowed at sight of that proud emblem while big black river jordan like divided the forlorn c s a from our canaan we crossed we gathered at the river we sang and danced and rested under the shade of the trees out from the gates of hell out from the jaws of death going home on our arrival at prison camp six miles in rear of vicksburg we received a glorious welcome and invitation to take something that is we were taken to the commissary where barrel after barrel of pickled cabbage was rolled out and the heads knocked in and we marching round and round gobbled out and ravenously devoured the cabbage and licked the vinegar from our fingers the sweetest dainty to my bleeding gums that ever i tasted we feasted on pickles next day we exchanged our filthy rags for clean clothing wrote home rested and feasted about twenty five hundred embarked on the sultana for st louis together with a good many passengers crowded jammed and packed on all the decks and guards and in the cabin but what cared the survivors of andersonville the war was over and we were going home nothing unusual occurred until we reached memphis although i had suffered much from fear of the boys crowding to one side of the boat and capsizing her one instance in particular while at helena a photographer was taking the boat and each soldier seemed to be bent on having his face discernible in the picture. I entreated and exhorted prudence while I sat on the roof, my feet pendant and my hands on a float, momentarily expecting a capsizing and sinking. Each night the cabin was filled with a row of double-deck cots. I had been fortunate in securing one of these, but on the night previous to reaching Memphis, I suddenly conceived and executed the purpose of making a stranger, whose name I never knew, our commissary sergeant in parole camp, occupy my cot while I spent the night in a chair. The boat lay at Memphis Wharf discharging freight, and the cots were being placed, when my friend of the night before came to me and asked if I had a cot. I pointed to my hat, placed on one to hold it. He said that one was in a hot, unpleasant, and dangerous place over the boilers, and that he had reserved one for me in the ladies' cabin, that I had my way the night before, and he must have his way now. "'Give it to some poor fellow who had none last night,' I said. But a moment afterwards he came and told me he had removed my hat to the cot selected by him, and that I would have to take that or none." Soon I retired to the cot, read until weary, fell asleep, 
was partly aroused by the boat leaving the wharf a little after midnight, but relapsed into sweet slumber, dreaming of the loved ones at home. A motherless daughter, a noble Christian mother, two devoted sisters, and my brothers. How I reveled in the joy of that reunion! A report as of the discharge of a park of artillery, a shock as of a railroad collision, and I am sitting bolt upright, straining my eyes and stretching my arms out into the Egyptian darkness, face, throat, and lungs burning as if immersed in a boiling cauldron. Crash, crash fall the chimneys on the roof. Oh, that I could shake off this horrible nightmare! But now from all around rise shrieks, cries, prayers, and groans. Have I awakened in the dark regions of the lost? I sprang to my feet, hastily dress, start forward, groping my way between the stateroom doors and the cots, to learn what has happened. Suddenly I find a yawning opening in the floor. I pause in doubt and uncertainty for a second, when the scene lights up from below, disclosing a picture that beggars all description, mangled, scalded human forms heaped and piled amid the burning debris on the lower deck. The cabin, roof, and Texas are cut in twain, the broken planks on either side of the break projecting downward, meeting the raging flames and lifting them to the upper decks. Women and little children in their night clothes, brave men who have stood undaunted on many a battlefield, all contribute to the confusion and horror of the scene as they suddenly see the impending death by fire, and wringing their hands tossing their arms wildly in the air, with cries most heart-rending, they rush pell-mell over the guard into the dark, cold waters of the river, while the old soldier is hastily providing for himself anything that will float, tables, doors, cots, partition planks, anything, everything. What a worse-than-babble of confusion of sights and sounds, as each seeks his own safety regardless of others. Where is the cot of my selection a few hours previous, and where its occupant? Ask of that holocaust below. There is a divinity that shapes our ends. Captain, will you please help me? I turned in the direction of the voice so polite, so cool and calm amid this confusion. There, on the head of the last cot, on this side of the breach, which was covered with pieces of the wreck, sat a man, bruised, cut, scalded in various places, both ankles broken and bones protruding. With his suspenders he had improvised tourniquets for both legs, to prevent bleeding to death. "'I am powerless to help you. I can't swim,' I replied. But he answered, "'Throw me in the river is all I ask.' I shall burn to death here. I called Captain Chapman of Lafayette, whom I never saw afterward, and we bore McCloyd aft and threw him overboard. I then got hold of a life preserver for myself, just as a frightened maiden in nightgown only rushed past me. I seized her as she was leaping from the guard and called the chambermaid, who put my life preserver on the girl. I then had no chance for escape, as I thought, and death seemed inevitable. I worked and toiled to my very utmost to assist others until all was done that I could do. Then the thought occurred to me that it was my duty to make an effort to save myself. I saw two Kentuckians meet, each lamenting that he could not swim. "'Then let us die together,' said one. Well, replied the other, and embraced in each other's arms, they leaped, sank, and the muddy waters closed over them. I saw others, blinded by the explosion, leap into the fire and die. I now cast about me for something I could use as a buoy, but everything available seemed to have been appropriated. I tried to improvise a life preserver out of a stool. I threw a mattress overboard. It floated and was at once caught on to by several who were struggling in the water. 
I got another mattress, and slipping down a fender onto the taffrail, I dropped it. But it no sooner touched the water than four men seized it, turned it over, and it went under as I jumped. Down, down I went into the chilly waters. Some poor drowning wretch was clutching at my legs, but putting my hands down to release myself and vigorously treading water, I rose strangling to the surface, my scalded throat and lungs burning with pain. The mattress was within reach, with only one claimant. God only knows what had become of the three others. Placing my arms on the support, I began a life-and-death struggle to escape from the falling wheelhouse, which I barely succeeded in doing, but its waves strangled me and came near sweeping my companion off. There seemed to be acres of struggling humanity on the waters, some on debris of the wreck, some on the dead carcasses of horses, some holding to swimming live horses, some on boxes, bales of hay, drift logs, etc. Soon we parted company with the wreck and the crowd and drifted out into the darkness almost alone. A boat, the General Boynton, passed near, whistled and hove to, but finding her efforts at rescue futile, she steamed away and gave the alarm at Memphis, and the gunboats and steamers there sent out lifeboats and yawls to pick up those floating by from several miles above. Having floated nearly five miles, we struck a small drift that seemed stationary, and that I correctly thought was on the overflowed Arkansas shore. I crawled upon a large floating tree. Chilled and benumbed, I could not sit up. I had three large doses of quinine in my pocket, took them all at once, and by vigorous rubbing soon was able to stand and walk. Meantime my companion was helpless and could not get on to my drift. I held the mattress to the drift, and with a keen switch I struck the man, who, by the way, was dressed in but one garment, and that a very brief one and striking first one place, then another, he begging piteously all the while, and rubbing where I struck, I hope he has forgiven me that whipping. I soon had him up, and together we pulled one young woman and two men out of the water, who soon chilled to death, in spite of all we could do for them. Shivering with cold, silently we paced back and forth on that floating cypress, Minutes seemed hours as we kept our lonely vigil over the lifeless form of that beautiful girl and of the two brave men who had passed the perils of field and prison, only to die in this way just when all danger seemed past. There was no sound to break the oppressive silence, save the splashing of the cruel waters and the gurgling moan of a poor fellow who had clasped his broken scalded arms over a scantling and drifted with his mouth just above the water and lodged near us, dying. An occasional feeble cry of distress nearby on the riverside was answered by voices up the bank. Oh, would morning never dawn on night so hideous? At last the sun, as if reluctant to light the scene of horror, slowly disclosed to my view the poor wretch clinging in unconsciousness to the floating scantling, who immediately expired when taken from the water. There were also to be seen some half-dozen soldiers on the roof of a cabin above us, and here and there a chilled half-frozen soldier clinging to the branches of a tree or perched on a bit of floating drift but my attention was devoted especially to a man some forty yards from me on the riverside, clinging to a pole or upright snag, worn smooth by the waters. When first I made him out, his feet were above the water, and he was climbing with all the strength he had to reach a projecting snag to rest thereon, but failing, he stopped then slipped gradually inch by inch down the pole until his feet were beneath the water again he tried to reach the rest above falling short of the point before reached so periodically climbing and falling back each time he sank lower 
and failed to climb as high as before. At last he had to throw his head back to keep his chin above water, and, climbing, he failed to get his waist out of the flood. Only a few minutes, and he will make his last futile effort, and the lifeless body will be borne away on the muddy tide. Oh, how I wish I could swim! Now comes a Confederate soldier in a bateau from his camp not far inland. I hail him and send him in haste to the rescue. With great effort and danger to himself, he drags the stiffened and almost lifeless body from that pole and bears it to a place of security on the log cabin roof, where with vigorous rubbing the boys soon bring him around. Here and there goes that bateau taking the imperil to places of safety. And now the Jenny Lind, a little steamer from Memphis, comes, and Johnny puts his passengers on board, taking them from cabin roof, drifts, and trees, myself the last one in sight. At the boat, Lieutenant McCord of Bellevue, Ohio, our Susan of Castle Reed, pulls me on board, and in the joy of the meeting we for the moment forget the loss of many of our brave companions. If Susan still lives, I wonder if he ever laughs over my giving him my red flannel drawers and of his promenade with me through Memphis to the quartermasters, barefoot and clad only in red shirt and drawers. Just after boarding the boat I saw a dugout, paddled by a citizen, coming out of the woods, and in the bottom there lay McCloyd. I helped lift him on board and lay him on deck and give him a tumbler of whiskey. When I left Memphis he was in the hospital there, and I know not whether he survived, but rather think he did. But what had become of my chivalrous knight of the gray? How he dignified the gray! Silently he had disappeared when his good work was done, with that modesty inseparable from true royalty of heart. Would that I knew his name! Reaching Memphis I met young Safford of North Madison, Indiana, whose father had joined us at Vicksburg as a sanitary commissioner. The father's arms were both badly scalded, and he was otherwise injured. The son put two life preservers on his father and one on himself, and they hastily got upon a stateroom door in the water. A horse leaping from the boat struck the door, knocking them off and separating them. The son was taken up unconscious, opposite Memphis, by the lifeboat from the Essex, and now restored, he was inquiring and searching for his father. Together he and I opened more than a hundred coffins on the wharf, hoping to have the satisfaction of giving him a burial, that his body should not be lodged on some bar to become food for fishes. Then together we visited the offices of a morning paper, where I for the first time gave my real name and command. Here we met Irwin, a United States scout, who had been the senior Safford's companion, and he gave the young man his father's watch, a very valuable gold one, and told us that Mr. Safford had been discovered and rescued in an unconscious state by some Negroes on President's Island, having floated twelve miles. The son took the first boat for the island, where he found his father, as had been told him, and took him to Madison some days after. I, with a number of surviving officers, was sent to quarters at a hospital. I was sent for that afternoon by Mrs. Harstock of Illinois, aunt of my deceased wife, who had seen my name in the paper. Soon I joined her at the fort below. When I returned to the city the second day afterward, I was hailed at every turn. "'Captain, they have left us. You must get transportation for us and take us home.' So I gathered up the boys, all who were able to be moved, about two hundred and fifty, and shipped them for Cairo. We had a dozen or more scalded men laid on the cabin floor and nursed them. At Cairo I placed the well in barracks and the wounded in hospitals for the night. I succeeded next day in getting cars, 
by which we arrived at Mattoon at early dawn of the day following. We had had nothing to eat for twenty-four hours, and there was no way to feed the men. Citizens crowded around to see the heroes of the great disaster, who, at my request, took the boys to their homes and breakfasted them. Then came trouble about cars. If cars should be sent thence to Indianapolis, they would be kept for debt owing by one road to the other. But on my personal pledge to return the coaches, we got them, which pledge the superintendent at Indianapolis cheerfully redeemed. From Mattoon, I wired the mayor of Terre Haute and also Governor Morton. Terre Haute gave us a dinner worthy of my grand old native state. At Indianapolis we found ambulances in waiting for the disabled, and a good supper prepared for all. Here I surrendered my charge, and, completely worn out by my watching and nursing on the river and rail, I stopped at the first inn I found, that of an Englishman, on Illinois Street near the Union Depot, who generously tendered the hospitalities of his home to me and my companions. My present occupation is farming and fruit growing. Post office address, Arba, Alabama. End of section 36. Section 37 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 37. William Fees. Adjutant National Sultana Survivors Association. I was born in Elmendingen, Baden, Germany, October 17, 1841. My parents emigrated to the United States in the year 1847 and located in New York City, from which place we removed to Marion, Ohio, in the month of September 1852. At the age of seventeen years I was apprenticed to learn the trade of cabinet-making. On the thirtieth day of October, 1861, I enlisted as a private in Company B, 64th Regiment, Ohio Volunteer Infantry, at Marion, Ohio, was appointed corporal November 16, 1862, and was promoted to sergeant April 1, 1864. I served with the company and regiment until January 1864, when I re-enlisted at Blaine's X Roads, East Tennessee, for three years longer, and was re-mustered January 27, 1864, in Company B, 64th Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry, participating in all the campaigns, battles, and skirmishes with the company and regiment, except the Battle of Chickamauga at which time I was on detached duty, and engaged in recruiting service. I was taken a prisoner with five others of my company at the Battle of Franklin, Tennessee, November thirtieth, 1864, marched the next day to Columbia, Tennessee, and after being held there a few days, we were marched with about 1,800 other prisoners at Corinth, Mississippi, Selma, and Montgomery, Alabama, finally reaching Meridian, Mississippi, where we were confined for a few days in a stockade. When we reached this place, most of us were in a deplorable condition, having marched several hundred miles over bad roads in the winter season, with scanty clothing and scantier rations. A great many were barefooted, and a number were sick. We were shipped from here to Andersonville, Georgia, I will not attempt a description of this hell on earth. Nearly all have read descriptions of it. On March 26, 1865, I, with several hundred others, was taken out of the prison, and finally, after a tedious journey, partly by rail and the rest of the distance on foot, we reached and were encamped on the Big Black River near Vicksburg, Mississippi. On the 23rd or 24th of April, according to the records of the War Department, 1865, paroled Union prisoners of war, of which number I was one, were loaded on board of the ill-fated steamboat Sultana at Vicksburg, Mississippi, more like so many cattle than men, 
which together with the passengers and crew made in all about two thousand and twenty one souls besides a freight cargo making in all a cargo of several times the carrying capacity of the boat and were headed up the river our destination being cairo illinois the sultana landed at memphis tennessee on the evening of april twenty sixth where a portion of her cargo of freight was discharged some time during that night the boat left the wharf at memphis and steamed up the river making a landing to take on coal before we left memphis my bunk mate comrade a o cranmer of my company and i fixed down our bed on the cabin deck and on the starboard side near the railing i remember just before i fell asleep captain mason in command of the boat came up from below to go to his stateroom i presume and was compelled to crawl around on the rail as the deck was so crowded with men lying down that he could not find room to step and was in consequence made the subject of several jokes after this incident i fell asleep and did not wake up until after the explosion which occurred about two o'clock a m at which time i was brought to my senses by some water which was thrown over me by some one on the hurricane deck when i came to my senses i found myself standing on a part of the wreck in front of and near the starboard wheelhouse surrounded by wreckage and in the midst of smoke and fire the agonizing shrieks and groans of the injured and dying were heart-rending and the stench of burning flesh was intolerable and beyond my power of description i was not aware at that time that the boilers had exploded but thought the boat had caught on fire judging from the injuries i received i must have been knocked senseless by the explosion as i found the left side of my face bruised and bleeding my left hand badly scalded and my left shoulder disabled which afterwards proved to be a very bad dislocation when i took in the situation and saw the dangerous place i was in i took hold of an iron brace rod near me which was so hot that it actually blistered my hands and scrambled onto the hurricane deck where i found a number of men trying to extinguish the fire by throwing water with buckets from them i first learned that the boilers had exploded from there i slid down a rope to the bow of the boat carrying with me a small wooden box which i thought might become useful to me in case i was compelled to take to the water i changed my mind however and threw it aside i saw a number of men bringing from the hold empty cracker barrels and jumping overboard with them but i saw they were worse than useless in keeping the heads of the men above water having only one head in them they would not balance just at this time the stage plank was lowered from its hangings and about as many as could get a hold of it were trying to launch it first on one side then on the other finally it went overboard carrying with it a great number but as it was heavily bound with iron it sank and must have carried down with it a great many who had a hold of it and others who were struggling in the water to keep afloat and save themselves seeing now that all other means of escape were cut off i began to look around for something to save myself with as it was now apparent the fire was fast gaining headway and would soon burn through the slight barrier formed by portions of the upper decks which had fallen down and which had up to this time kept most of the flames from reaching those of us who were on the bow of the boat just at this time i saw robert white a member of my regiment standing with one arm around a flagstaff looking on the struggling mass of humanity in the water below him as i knew he had followed steamboating before the war i thought he might be able to give me some advice i went to him and said bob what is to be done and all he said was billy i guess we will all be drowned or burned up i was of the same opinion but made up my mind to at least make an effort for my life in which i was successful while poor bob was either drowned or burned up as he predicted for i never saw him again after this incident i went aft a short distance to find if possible something that would keep my head above water 
but all I could find was some splinters of boards. Everything else had been taken, even to a box which had contained a live alligator. I had picked up a piece of rope with which I tied the splinters together into a convenient bundle. About this time the fire had burned through the wreckage, and it became apparent that those of us who were still on board would either be compelled to jump overboard or burn up. I chose the former, and went over with my bundle, and sank a few feet under water. I rose to the surface, and about this time some other fellow, who I thought must have weighed at least two hundred pounds, came down on top of me and knocked me under again. When I again came to the surface, my bundle of splinters was gone, and I was just about gone myself, as some other fellow had taken a hold of me, but I kicked him loose. Notwithstanding my disabled condition, and being at best only a poor swimmer, I managed to keep my head above water at least a part of the time, and get away from the mass of men struggling for life. When I was just about exhausted and thought my time had come, I came to a fellow with a nice large board. He was the only occupant, but I saw at once that he was very much excited and was not making any headway. I took hold of the board, throwing my disabled left arm over it, when he cried to me, "'For God's sake, let go! I am drowning!' I said to him, "'You fool, keep cool. This board is large enough to save both of us, and several more if managed right.' But he did not heed my advice, and at once made an effort to get it away from me by whirling it over and over edgewise he going over with it at almost every revolution. I kept very cool, occasionally putting my hands on it, thus keeping myself afloat, knowing that he must soon exhaust and perhaps drown himself, which proved to be correct, as he soon disappeared below the surface and sank to rise no more. When I had full possession, I struck out as best and as fast as I could, fearing that others might want to take passage with me, but not knowing where the strong current would land me. After being in the water for quite a long time, which seemed to me an age, part of the time in company with others going down the river, some swimming, others floating on driftwood and all conceivable kinds of rafts, everything that would float being utilized. Some were shouting for help, others praying, singing, laughing or swearing. I finally came in sight of some bushes, which I took to be on the shore, but which as I afterward learned was the larger one of a group of islands called the Hen and Chickens. The current carried me in some distance, and I brought up by a cottonwood sapling. I thought perhaps I could touch bottom here, but found the water too deep, the river at that time being very high, overflowing the islands and surrounding country. Realizing that in the condition that I was then in, being almost chilled to death, that unless I could get out of the water I would probably perish before help would reach me, I made an effort to climb the sapling, but being then almost helpless I failed in my first attempt and almost lost my life, for I slipped into the water over my head but with the assistance of my board my second effort was successful and i found myself safely perched on the sapling where i had plenty of time to meditate upon the situation i thought of a great many things of home relatives and friends and of my poor comrades who must have perished but particularly of my intimate friend and comrade a o cranmer who i knew had a wife and children at home anxiously awaiting his coming but who I thought must surely have perished, for he could not swim a stroke. I sat on my perch trying to keep from freezing by fighting buffalo gnats, which were very annoying, until some time after daybreak, when I heard a steamboat coming up the river, and knew by the shouts for help of those who were similarly situated as myself, and from the frequent stops of the engines, that help was near at hand. In a few moments the boat was near me. They saw me and sent a rowboat in after me. I was lifted by willing hands from my uncomfortable seat, placed in the boat, 
carried to the steamboat and lifted upon the decks the first person i saw was my dear friend a o cranmer whom i had given up for lost but he had landed on the same island and was picked up just a few moments before i was to say it was one of the happiest meetings of my life would hardly express it i was immediately given some hot stimulants and plenty of hot coffee and was put into a nice warm bed in due time the boat landed us at the wharf at memphis where those of us who were injured were given some clothing by good ladies and conducted to a hospital when the boat landed us i saw standing on the wharf major coulter formerly of my regiment who was then on his way to some southern port he reached out his hand but was so overcome with grief that he could scarcely utter a word he had been with us the evening before treating and giving some of us a little spending money little thinking at the time that so many would so soon find watery or fiery graves i was placed in a ward with quite a number who were severely scalded or otherwise badly injured and such misery and intense suffering as i witnessed while there is beyond my power to describe the agonizing cries and groans of the burned and scalded were heart-rending and almost unendurable but in most cases the suffering was of short duration as the most of them were relieved by death in a few hours i suffered intense pain from my injuries especially from my dislocated shoulder and scalded hand not having had any attention from the surgeons in charge but i did not murmur or complain as i saw all around me numbers of poor fellows whose injuries needed attention more than mine a kind-hearted matron came to my cot and washed me and wrote a few lines to my parents informing them of the disaster and that i was saved it was then that i thought again of my good kind mother at home and longed to be with her as i fancied i could see a strong resemblance between them i was finally taken to the operating room put under the influence of chloroform and the dislocation reduced and my other injuries attended to i did not remain long at the hospital i soon found a number of my comrades and with them without leave or orders boarded a boat bound for cairo as none of us had transportation or money with which to pay our fare the captain and clerk after some parleying kindly consented to carry us in due time we arrived at cairo and after getting transportation from the quartermaster's department were sent to columbus some to camp chase the injured ones to trepler hospital where right in sight of the capital of our own glorious state of ohio we were treated more like brutes than soldiers and were almost starved to death by some inhuman dishonest scoundrel in the employ of the government i had too much grit to put up with such treatment and took french leave and left for home where i soon received notice to return immediately to be mustered out of the service may thirtieth eighteen sixty five under a special telegraphic order from the war department having served just three years and seven months in the army in all that long service i am pleased to say i was not at any time sick enough to go to a hospital and was only once wounded and that only slightly at the battle of stone river about twenty members of my regiment were aboard of the sultana at the time of the disaster ten of whom were lost i quote from the records of the war department a copy of which i have in my possession the following the reports and testimony show that there were one thousand eight hundred and sixty six troops on the sultana including thirty three paroled officers one officer who had resigned and the captain in charge of the guard of these seven hundred and sixty five including sixteen officers were saved and one thousand one hundred and one including nineteen officers were lost there were seventy cabin passengers and eighty-five crew on board of whom some ten to eighteen were saved giving a loss of a hundred and thirty seven making a total loss of one thousand two hundred and thirty eight 
I had always estimated the loss greater, but presume the records are correct, and am only too glad that the loss was not greater. It was without doubt the greatest marine disaster on record, in either ancient or modern times, and I am surprised that so little is remembered about it at this time, and especially by persons who were at that time great readers, and can to this day tell all about some battle or skirmish or other disaster where the loss of life was trifling as compared to this. Present Occupation, Furniture Dealer and Undertaker Post Office Address, Marion, Ohio End of Section 37section thirty eight of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section thirty eight nathaniel fogelsong i was born at mansfield richland county ohio in the year eighteen forty two and moved from there to wright hillsdale county michigan when ten years of age living there until the fall of eighteen sixty two I enlisted to defend my country and to stand by the old flag in Company A of the 18th Michigan Infantry. From Wright we went to Camp Woodbury, Hillsdale, Michigan. I served with my regiment in all its campaigns until captured at the Battle of Athens, Alabama, on the 24th of September, 1864, by Forrest's Cavalry. They robbed us of our blankets, watches, and of all our valuables and then we marched over rough roads, through rivers, and by rail to Cahaba, Alabama, where we remained until the 12th of April, 1865, when we were taken to Camp Fisk, which is four miles from Vicksburg, Mississippi, there to be recruited up so that we could stand a journey north. They commenced giving us one-quarter rations and increased it as we starved creatures could stand it. We remained here until we received orders to board the train at 5 o'clock p.m. on the 24th of April, 1865, for Vicksburg. While at Vicksburg, the steamer Sultana came steaming in with passengers and crew numbering 110. The steamer remained here about 30 hours, and during that time was boarded by 1,996 federal soldiers and 35 officers just released from the prisons at Cahaba, Alabama, Andersonville, and Macon, Georgia, and belonging to the states of Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. We were crowded on the boat like a flock of sheep, until the whole number of passengers was 2,141, besides horses, mules, and a large number of hogsheads of sugar, over six times her capacity. The overloaded boat steamed out of Vicksburg at 1 o'clock a.m. on the 25th of April and arrived at Helena, Arkansas at 7 o'clock a.m. and left there at 8 o'clock. The boat ran smoothly and the soldiers were enjoying the thought of being homeward bound. Yes, with joy that cannot be expressed, although many of them were suffering from wounds received in battle, and all were sadly emaciated from starvation in the prison pens where we had been confined. But now we were en route for home. The cruel war was over, and the long struggle closed. Battles, sieges, marches, and prison pens were things of the past. We arrived at Memphis at seven o'clock in the evening of the 26th. A guard was stationed at the edge of the boat with orders not to let any of the prisoners get off. I was not very well, so I did not disturb the guard, but a number of the boys went off the boat and enjoyed themselves. After unloading the cargo of sugar, she took on a supply of coal and then started from Memphis about one o'clock in the morning of the 27th. So far the presence of danger was not manifested nor was it in the least anticipated, except that the boat was heavily loaded. But in the darkness of that terrible morning, between two and three o'clock, just opposite Tegelman's Landing, eight miles above Memphis, suddenly and without warning, the steamer exploded one of her boilers with terrific force, 
and in a few moments the boat burned to the water's edge. The steamer was running at the rate of nine or ten miles an hour. Mr. Roberry, the chief mate, who had charge of the boat, and who was among the survivors, was in the pilot house with Mr. Clayton, the pilot, at the time of the explosion. At that time I was sound asleep, and the first thing I knew or heard was a terrible crash and everything coming down upon us. I was lying on the lower deck near the stern of the boat. I laid still a few minutes after the explosion, and my comrade said, "'Thaniel, why don't you get up? The boat is all on fire.' My reply was that I could not swim, but they said, "'Get ready and go with us.' I told them to save their own lives, as I might be the cause of losing them. I went with them to the edge of the boat, and there we saw that the water was full of men, horses, and mules. Several of the boys were determined to jump off into the river, but I persuaded them to wait till the water was clearer, and they did so, thus saving their lives. I still remained on the boat and heard the cries of comrades for help some of them calling on God for help, while others took his name in vain. One poor fellow, Pat Larkey, who belonged to Company E of my regiment, had secured a board, and it seemed that every time he would try it, it would throw him off into the river. Pat shouted, "'Come help poor Pat! He is a-drowning!' The poor fellow went down. By this time the flames were cracking and snapping over my head, threatening my life. I was thinking whether to burn or drown, when a woman with a little babe about two months old came to me crying for help. I told her it was every one for himself. I saw that she had on a life preserver, but it was buckled down too low. I stepped up to her and was going to unbuckle it when she said, "'Soldier, don't take that off from me.' I said, "'It must be up under your arms.' I placed it there and took her by the hand, and she jumped into the water. She thanked me and said, "'May the Lord bless you.' She lost her husband, baby, father, and mother there. When I saw my condition, I went down upon my knees and asked God to be merciful to me, a sinner, and offered up the following prayer. O oh Lord, if it is thy will for me to be drowned on the Mississippi, all is well, or if not, may I return home to see my father, brothers, and sisters. I then climbed up on the banisters close to the rudder. Being weak and feeble, I almost lost my hold. I grasped tighter and drew myself up, and getting a new hold, reached out my arm so that I could just place my fingers and foot on the rudder then bent my head and body, shoved my arm around the rudder, and as I let go, dropped down onto the lower deck. While hanging to the rudder, a man cried, "'Get off from me!' I replied, "'In a minute!' There were nine of us that had hold of that rudder, and I, being the top one, kept quiet. Soon the coals from above began to fall on my head and shoulders, and I began to think that I must get out of there. A part of the deck burned off and fell into the water, and I tried to get those that were under me to swim and get on to it, but all they said was, My God, if we let go of this we shall drown. I answered, Let us die like men, helping ourselves, for God helps those who help themselves in this case, and I believe in all others. The coals came thicker and faster so that I had to brush them off my head and shoulders with one hand and hang on to the rudder with the other. It will be seen that I had now to do something. Consequently, I made up my mind, by the assistance of God and His mighty power, that I would jump into the water and cried, Here goes for ninety days. I sank three times, and as I came up the third time, I grabbed a comrade by the heel. While catching my breath, he kicked me loose, and down I went again. As I came up, I grabbed the same comrade by the ankle with one hand, and with the other grabbed a wire rope to which I hung, being nearly exhausted. 
looking around i found a piece of scantling about three by four and i thought it would help me in getting to a piece of deck which had floated away from the boat so i went kicking and paddling like a dog till i reached the piece of deck as i climbed upon it i heard comrade borns of my regiment say my god is that you i replied yes all that is left of me he then said i have two boards and you shall have one i then started for the center of the deck there was a hole burned in it which i did not observe and down i went but throwing out my arms i recovered myself before falling far afterwards i was more careful moving around closer to the edge of the piece of deck when behold there laid one of the deck hands and two women scalded to death i found a door and a piece of siding i took the piece of siding and shoved the door down to the comrades that were hanging on the rudder and finally they all got upon the piece of deck by this time the citizens had their raft made and came and took us to the shore where there was a log stable and near it was a log heap where we warmed ourselves and dried our clothes as sergeant borns was destitute of clothing and the wind being very chilly i took my pants and blouse and gave them to him thus leaving me with my shirt and drawers born said to me fogelsong let us go and pray to god thanking him for saving our lives and permitting us to stand upon the earth once more i agreed and he made the best and most fervent prayer that i had ever heard soon after this a boat came along took us on board and carried us back to memphis i crawled into a bunk and soon fell asleep the first thing i knew two sisters of charity came along and said here is a soldier they awoke me and i asked what do you want they said we want to put dry and clean clothes on you i was so weak that i could not stand alone but they dressed and led me to the top of the stairs where a lieutenant of an indiana regiment took me carried me down and placed me on a bus with those two ladies they took me to the overton hospital and as i went into a ward one of my comrades of my regiment sergeant nelson vogelsong grabbed me saying i never expected to see you again after i left you on the boat he is dead now they took me to the next ward which was quite well filled with the boys that were on the boat some of them nearly dead and dying with the injuries received from the exposure i remained in the hospital ten days then went by boat to cairo illinois and from there by rail to camp chase ohio where i was discharged from the service on the twenty first of june eighteen sixty five and then went home to wright hillsdale county michigan where i now reside end of section thirty eight section thirty nine of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section thirty nine martin frazy i was born at west farms new york january first eighteen forty one and enlisted in the service of the united states at milton indiana april eighteenth eighteen sixty one in company c second regiment indiana cavalry and was captured near scottsville alabama april second eighteen sixty five and confined in the stockades at meridian mississippi for about one week i hardly think it necessary for me to give my sultana experience as i have no doubt that there will be plenty of experiences of far greater interest than mine i will just state however that i was severely scalded on my body and feet and did not walk for five months after the explosion my present occupation is that of carpenter and my post office address is twelve o nine new main street louisville kentucky end of section thirty nine section forty of loss of the sultana by chester d berry 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 40. W. S. Friesner. I was born at Logan, Ohio, August 19, 1838, and enlisted in the service of the United States, October 9, 1861, in Company K, 58th Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry. I was never captured. Was the officer in command of the guard in charge of the paroled prisoners. When the explosion occurred, I was the last one to leave the boat. There were a few men still on the forecastle, forward of the burning debris, whom I saw after I left the boat, some of whom, I was informed, were taken off by rescuing parties. I floated off on a stateroom door. I think I was in the water for nearly two hours, and was picked up by the steamer Bostonia. Post Office Address, Logan, Ohio. End of Section 40「Section forty one of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section forty one. Henry Gamble. Henry Gamble was born in Blaine, Lawrence County, Kentucky, December seventeenth, eighteen forty four, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Louisville, Kentucky, April tenth, eighteen sixty three, in Company B. 14th Regiment Kentucky Infantry. Was captured near Adairsville, Georgia, August 13, 1864, and confined in the Milledgeville and Andersonville, Georgia prisons. He says, At the time of the explosion I was asleep at the head of the stairway, in front of the cabin, with Elisha Carusit of Company G, 14th Regiment Kentucky Infantry. He was killed, and I received a severe wound in my left leg. I helped to cut down and throw overboard a stage plank, and got upon it with twenty-five other comrades. One of them caught me by the shoulders. I finally succeeded in getting him to release his hold in time to save my own life, but he was drowned. I then beseeched my comrades to get off the stage plank and rest themselves on its edges. By so doing it would not turn over, hold us all up, and we would be safe. But my pleadings availed nothing. Finally they all drowned but myself and four others. We succeeded in steering it to the wall of an old stable that was almost under water caused by the high tide of the Mississippi River. When we reached that most coveted spot I was so weak and exhausted that my comrades had to help me to a place of safety. We remained there until about sunrise, when we were rescued from our perilous condition and taken back to Memphis with joy and delight. My present occupation is that of a merchant. Post office address, Blaine, Kentucky. End of section 41 Section 42 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 42. Daniel Garber. I was born in Washington County, Pennsylvania, April 8, 1828, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Belleville, Ohio, August 16, 1862 in Company E, 102nd Regiment, Ohio Volunteer Infantry, as a private. The regiment was assigned to the 20th Army Corps. I engaged in the campaign in Kentucky and Tennessee in pursuit of the rebel General Bragg in 1862. In all the marches and engagements of the regiment I took part, from Louisville, Kentucky, until I was taken prisoner at Athens, Alabama, September 23, 1864. The Union forces were attempting to drive General Hood back. I was at the time afflicted with catarrh in my left hand, and was unable for duty. I, with about forty others, was quartered in a large brick mansion which for the time served as a hospital. The rebel cavalry under command of General N. B. Forrest captured the town of Athens, and surrounding the hospital, 
made prisoners of all within except a comrade who escaped by climbing up the chimney they were then taken by the way of cherokee to meridian mississippi and while passing through here a citizen asked where did all those yanks come from the colonel in charge replied they are chiefly from ohio and indiana and are good boys they may be good boys but they have stolen all our negroes was the reply we continued our journey through selma alabama to cahaba in the same state when we arrived here we were required to register and received instructions as to the position of the deadline which it was certain death to cross i once stepped over this line but fortunately was not seen by the guard an escape was planned and the inside guard was overpowered and disarmed while the guard outside ran away but owing to the lack of decisive action on the part of the prisoners the attempt failed and we were driven back into the prison a cannon was planted in the door of the main building and we were called upon to surrender our punishment was a fast of forty-eight hours in the meantime a guard had said he had bayoneted a prisoner and we were compelled to undress and hold our clothes above our heads and march between the guards but fortunately he was not discovered on or about the first of march eighteen sixty five the alabama river got very high owing to the incessant rain for the past few days and consequently overflowed the prison to the depth of two feet at the highest place making it very disagreeable for we had no place to stand up or lie down but in the water about the sixteenth or seventeenth of march i was taken out with the last squad for parole and we were taken via selma demopolis and jackson mississippi while overnight at demopolis sergeant d p canada of my company died we stopped a day at jackson where a few of the boys drew some clothes from there we were taken to big black in the rear of vicksburg where we arrived on the twenty-first day of march our men received us under the glorious stars and stripes on the twenty-second and we went into parole camp three or four miles in the rear of vicksburg here we remained until the twenty-fifth or twenty-sixth of april when i with about twenty-one hundred other paroled prisoners was taken on board the ill-fated steamer sultana we started up the broad mississippi with fond hopes of soon seeing the dear ones at home but how few of us had the pleasure of realizing these hopes we arrived at memphis a short time before dark and took on coal and other matters we left memphis shortly after midnight on the twenty seventh and when seven miles above there the steamer's boiler exploded i was at that time lying by the side of the pilot house with corporal jacob irons of my company and was asleep when it occurred my first recollection was that i was on my feet and enveloped in a cloud of hot steam and was considerably scalded in the face after the steam had risen i said to corporal irons what is the matter and he said the boat had blown up he seemed to be very much excited and told me they thought they could make the shore these were the last words he spoke to me but as the boys kept jumping off from the boat into the river he kept calling for them not to for they would all be saved i then began to look around to devise some means of escape I stepped back to where some of my company's boys were untying a yawl. I thought that I would help them get it down, and then I thought if I did they would all jump for it and perhaps be lost, which I learned afterward was the case. I then got a shutter and board from off the pilot house and tied them together with a pair of drawers. By that time the flames had come through. I then got over the railing behind the wheelhouse and climbed down to the lower deck. By this time all was confusion, and men were jumping off into the river to get away from the flames. I looked around for a clear place to jump, for I knew that if I jumped in where men were struggling, 
they would seize my board and I would be lost, for I could swim but very little. I waited a short time, and when there was an opening large enough I threw my board in, jumped on, and went down under quite a way, but came up all right and floated away from the boat. After I had gone four or five rods, a bundle of clothing came floating along, and I took it with my right hand and held on to the board with my left. I then floated with the current. Think I went on the south side of the island. I saw a boat going up on the other side and could see it by the side of the wreck as I floated down the river. I also remember seeing the lights of Memphis as I went past. I was picked up four miles below Memphis by two men in a yawl and rowed to the gunboat Pocahontas, where I was taken in, eleven miles from the scene of the disaster. I wish to state here that there were thirteen of my company on board the Sultana, and but two besides myself were saved. Their names were William Lockhart and William Yeasley. About the last thing I remembered was that I was very nearly chilled to death and could not survive much longer. They gave me some stimulants, and I did not remember any more until the next morning when I found myself undressed and between two mattresses. We were given red drawers and shirts by the Christian Sanitary Commission. I was then taken to the Gayozo House, where I think I stopped two days. After drawing clothing, we were put on the steamer Bell of St. Louis, our destination being Cairo, Illinois. While going there in the night, I remember several incidents that were amusing. Some of the more timid were springing up at every little noise, thinking there was going to be another explosion. At one time we supposed that we were having a race with another boat, and one comrade said if he had a gun he would shoot the captain. I wish to mention another little incident right here. There chanced to be a citizen on the boat, and discovering that I was a mason, he gave me a dollar and told me to get something I needed with it. I thanked him very cordially, for it was the first money I had in my possession for a long time. I hope if he is living now and sees this, he will remember this incident and will know that I have not forgotten him. I think we arrived at Cairo in the evening of the second day after leaving Memphis. We left here after twelve o'clock that night for Mattoon, Illinois, where we arrived the next day about two o'clock, and here the good citizens gave us a lunch. Our next destination was Terre Haute, Indiana, which we reached at ten that night. We remained here until the next morning. Our next move was to Indianapolis. We stopped there part of a day. From there we went to Camp Chase, Ohio, where we arrived on the 4th or 5th of May, 1865. Here I was discharged by special telegram from the War Department on the 21st. When I came home I worked at my old trade on the shoe bench for about ten years. Since that time I have been farming. Have raised a family of four girls and three boys, and all are married but one boy. My post office address is Butler, Ohio. End of section 42section 43 of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section 43 stephen m gaston i was born january 11th 1850 at centerville wayne county indiana and am perhaps the youngest ex-prisoner of war if not the youngest soldier that was in the service I enlisted in the service of the United States at Indianapolis, Indiana, October 19, 1863, in Company K, 9th Indiana Volunteer Cavalry, 121st Regiment. Was captured by General Forrest's troops at Sulphur Branch Trestle, September 25, 1864, while on our way to relieve the troops stationed in Athens, Alabama, 
and was confined as a prisoner of war until about the 10th of April, 1865, at Cahaba, Alabama, when we were formally exchanged. Were sent from Cahaba to the mouth of Tom Bigby River, up that river to Gainesville, thence to West Point, Meridian, and Jackson, Mississippi, to Black River, where the commissioners had established a camp of exchange. Comrades, it did my very soul good to see the old flag floating in the breezes once more, proclaiming to the world that it still floats, and is able to shelter those who desire its protection. Many shed tears, a few shouted, but the majority were too overcome to give vent to their feelings, and said, Thank God we are surely exchanged, and will not be returned to that hell-hole of misery again. After crossing the river, we were taken to parole camp, about four miles from Vicksburg, and after some little rest in camp, we were ordered, that is, I was along with others, for at parole camp nearly every regiment in the service was represented, on board the Sultana, to the number, I always understood, of twenty-three hundred. Sixteen of that number belonged to Company K, Ninth Indiana Cavalry. We arrived at Memphis safely, and discharged some two hundred hogsheads of sugar, and also some horses. I found a hogshead of sugar broken, as soldiers always do find, and my comrade, William Block, and I filled everything we could find with sugar, intending to eat the sugar and hardtack while going up the river to our destination. We stored our sugar in front of the pilot house at our heads, for we had made this place our bunk and turned in for the night. Our evening dreams were sweet, for we had eaten about two pounds of sugar each, and then were we not going home to see our loved ones who had mourned for us as dead? We dreamed the soldiers' dreams of home and loved ones, of camp life, of the battle and the prison, the scanty fare and the cruel guards, when suddenly our dreams were broken. I felt myself raised to a height, and then a crash came. The smokestack had fallen directly on the pilot house, crushing it down almost on us. I felt for Block and called his name, but no answer came. The cries of the wounded were heard all around me. I was a prisoner again, for a network of rubbish surrounded me. The stack above the remnant of the wheelhouse behind the boat was on fire, and directly below some poor fellows were wedged in at my right hand and begged for help. I was helpless and could render no assistance. They soon smothered from the heat and smoke. After trying again and again, I finally extricated myself, and going to the hatchway or steps, I found my way obstructed and debris scattered everywhere. I finally concluded to jump to the lower deck, but found I could swing down on the breaching of the stack. I did so, and, oh, God, what a sight! I was on the bow of the boat and could not see aft, but what misery I did see was enough for me. Men were crying, praying, swearing, and begging, wounded in every shape, some with broken legs and arms, others scalded, burnt, and dying. Their cries made the already dark night hideous, lighted up by the now fiercely burning boat. My senses remained, and I thought it would be best to try some mode of escape. I was wounded and badly scraped from my exertion to get from under the smokestack. On looking around, I found an empty flour barrel, and divesting myself of clothing, I jumped into the chilling waters. Taking the precaution to see that no person was near, I was fortunate to get clear of the boat without encountering anyone although two or three tried to get to me, but drowned before reaching me. I saw at least twenty men drown at once. As fast as one would feel he was drowning, he would clutch at the nearest, and I believe many a bold swimmer was drowned that night who could have saved himself if alone. I was finally rescued by a lifeboat from the steamer Bostonia, and taken to the cabin of that steamer in a cramped and exhausted condition, and was then taken in an ambulance to Overton Hospital. 
after remaining there three days was sent to the soldiers retreat then with some three hundred others forwarded to camp chase ohio i stopped at terre haute my home and followed in the evening to indianapolis thence to camp chase from which place i ran away and reported back to indianapolis to adjutant general noble and was given transportation home and a pass for twenty days was discharged at indianapolis june twenty eighth eighteen sixty five my occupation is that of engineer of eagle mills end of section forty three section forty four of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section forty four w n goodrich i was born in whiteford township monroe county michigan november twenty first eighteen forty two and at the present am living in the city of menominee michigan enlisted in the service of the united states at ridgeway lenawee county michigan on the thirty first of july eighteen sixty two in company e of the eighteenth michigan infantry after a short stay in camp at hillsdale we proceeded to what we supposed was the front but which was kentucky after tramping through most of this state and spending one winter at lexington we finally in april or may of eighteen sixty three boarded the cars for the front but we were again mistaken and only got as far as nashville tennessee where we halted at a large building called zollicoffer building we remained there two or three days spending most of our time in killing graybacks as they were thicker than fleas on a dog from there we went into camp which was very much better and i thought if this was the front it was about as nice as could be soon however our fun began being on duty almost every other day it was fun for a time but soon became a drudge we remained there a long year and then the glad news came for us to pack up and go to the front this was some time in may or june we started for the seat of war or what we supposed to be it arriving at decatur alabama in the night and pitched our tents just outside of the city on the hills that were covered with the filth and rubbish of the city on the twenty third of september it was reported that a band of johnnies were tearing up the track near athens alabama and a detail of about four hundred men was made from our brigade and boarded a train of flat cars some time in the night crossing the river and waiting until daylight we then proceeded as far as we could on the cars then going on foot for a short distance we were suddenly fired upon by the enemy the firing was returned by us and the enemy fled our orders were to go to athens so we went on getting inside of athens what did we see johnnies all around us hundreds of them in our front and rear we fought with them the best we could and tried to get to the fort as our dear old stars and stripes were still flying but alas as we had got almost there the gate swung open and out marched our boys in blue what could we do but surrender it was with long faces that a flag of truce was sent to the commander that we had surrendered soon we were surrounded by the johnnies asking for something to eat it seemed to me as though they were about starved and we soon found that our captor was general forrest when i heard this i thought my time had come as the massacre at fort pillow was fresh in my memory we did not remain long at athens but were hurried off to a southern prison cahaba alabama where we were fed on corn meal for almost six months when the glad news came that we were to leave some thought for andersonville others thought for home it proved to be the latter after riding in dirty box cars and then marching we arrived at big black river on the twenty first of march eighteen sixty five and remained in camp which was four miles from vicksburg for about three or four weeks 
Then the glad news came that we were to go north and be exchanged. We marched to Vicksburg and went on board the steamer Sultana. We were a jolly crowd, but our joy was of short duration. Everything went along smoothly until we were about eight miles above Memphis, when the explosion took place by which so many lives were lost. As for myself, I had no thoughts of dying just then, so I looked around among the wreck and found a box, carried it to the side of the boat, and waited until the coast was clear, then threw it overboard and jumped in after it. It seemed to me as though I was going down to the bottom, but such was not the case. Soon coming to the surface of the water, I seized the box and started down the river for shore, or any place where I could get out of the water. After floating and swimming about four miles, I landed safely on a small willow tree. Soon after getting nicely fixed on the branches, making myself as comfortable as possible under the circumstances, a man by the name of Williams of the 1st Kentucky Cavalry came floating along and caught hold of a log that was fast to the tree. After watching him a few minutes, I descended from my perch and helped him upon the log, held him there for two hours, and was rewarded by seeing him come to life again, as he was as near dead as anyone I have seen who was not dead. Early in the morning of the 27th of April, boats were seen coming up the river searching for the victims of the disaster. Some of the poor fellows were hanging to the trees, some were on logs, and some were found in almost every conceivable place. At about eight o'clock I was picked up, taken on board a steamer, and about twelve o'clock landed at Memphis. Remaining there four days, I again started for the north, this time with fear, thinking that we might meet with the same catastrophe, but we landed safely at Cairo, Illinois, there boarded the train for Camp Chase, Ohio. Arriving there, I remained two weeks, and then was sent to my native state, where I was discharged from the service. My occupation? Mail carrier. End of section 44《セクション45of Loss of the Sultana》by Chester D. Berry。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。セクション45。N. W. Gregory。I was born in Erie County, Ohio, June 8, 1845, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Norwalk, Ohio, December 28, 1861, in Company C. 55th Regiment Ohio Volunteers, and was captured at South Mountain, Georgia, October 28, 1864, and confined in the Andersonville, Georgia, prison. At the time of the accident was asleep on the cabin deck. I was, of course, aroused from my slumber, and found myself mixed up with the debris of the wreck. Had some difficulty in releasing myself from between the two decks, but after some little time succeeded. I found there were a great many looking for safer quarters. The jam of men was so great that after I slid down it seemed impossible for me to get a foothold, and I came near being carried overboard by the surging crowd, but after a long struggle got on my feet again. By this time the fire was beginning to drive the crowd back, and I saw the time was short for anyone to stay on the boat. Seeing a large coil of rope at one end, fast to the boat, I threw it overboard, got ready for a swim, but before jumping made a search for pieces of boards or something that would give me some assistance after I left the wreck, which I did not intend to do until the fire forced me off. I managed to get a couple of panels of a door and by this time the heat was more than I could bear, so I let myself down into the water with the rope which I had prepared before. The water was alive with men for some distance from the wreck, but I was a good swimmer and made good use of it, that is, as good as I could after being six months at Andersonville prison and not having strength for a very long struggle in the water. After being in the water a short time, 
I got to an old tree. There were three men on it already. After a couple of hours I was so chilled and stiff that if I had been forced into the water I could not have helped myself. One of the men that was on the tree chilled and drowned before he was rescued. I was taken from the water by the steamboat Silver Spray about eight o'clock in the morning, not far from where the explosion took place. Was taken to Memphis and placed in the hospital. Have many thanks for the people of Memphis for the good care and treatment of the survivors. On the way north, after starting for home, there were sixty of us in the crowd that left Memphis. Was pleased when we arrived at Cairo, Illinois, for I had a dread of steamboat travel. There was an incident on the way after leaving Cairo that is well worth mentioning. I am sorry that I cannot remember the place or the name of the family that is connected with the incident. The cars stopped at a small town just at three o'clock in the morning after riding all night from Cairo. At this place we were obliged to stay until ten, as we had to change roads. After a short stay at the depot I took a stroll upon one of the streets, and when near a large fine-looking place I was taking a view of it when a man came out and invited me in. I readily accepted. Taking me into the sitting-room, I found nine of the boys all waiting for breakfast. After the meal was over, the man of the house provided himself with ten one-dollar bills and gave one to each of us. I have given him many a thought, but, like all other soldiers, I was careless at the time. I hope this will remind some of them who were there of the incident, if they are living, and in this way I may find out the name of this family. My present occupation is mining. Post office address, Lead City, South Dakota. End of section 45《Section 46 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Section 46. Samuel C. Haynes. I was born in Burlington County, New Jersey, March 5, 1843, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Lafayette, Indiana, December 10, 1861, in Company G. 40th Regiment Indiana Volunteer Infantry, and was captured at the Battle of Franklin, Tennessee, November 30, 1864, and confined in the Andersonville, Georgia prison. About the 1st of April, 1865, I, with about 600 other starved prisoners, was taken from the prison to Vicksburg and paroled. We waited there several days and regained much of our lost strength. While there we heard of President Lincoln's assassination, which caused greater grief than any defeat we had received while on the battlefield. The remaining time his assassination was the subject of heated conversation, and the Southern sympathizers kept well out of our way. At last word came for us to get ready to go home. We boarded the ill-fated Sultana in the afternoon. Myself and two comrades, john thompson and charles may of company g fortieth regiment indiana infantry both were lost went directly to the upper deck back of the pilot house and laid down to sleep we awoke when they stopped at memphis but after leaving there we went to sleep again and knew nothing until awakened by the explosion about the first thing I thought of was that some raiding rebel battery had thrown a shell into the boat. I then heard screams of men below. Someone cried, Keep quiet, keep quiet, we will run ashore. That made me feel good. In a few moments fire broke out, and as I could not swim I stayed on board until driven off by the heat. I helped tear off a flight of stairs from the passenger deck to the hurricane deck, intending to jump in the water with it, but quickly changed my mind. I talked a moment with Nathan D. Everman, an excellent swimmer. He promised me help, 
but when he saw me afterward he bid me good-bye, saying that I was all right. After leaving the stairs and Everman, I ran into the cabin, clutched a bunk with both hands, and jumped into the river with it. It went down twice with me. I let loose of it after the second sinking, having swallowed some water and almost strangled. I could not keep my head out of the water, and thinking I was going to drown, I began to dive, hoping to find something to cling to and reach the shore. In a few minutes I found myself near two men clinging to a board. They tried to keep me off, but I was too strong for them, and succeeded in getting a firm hold on it. They afterwards told me they were good swimmers, and the board would float all three of us. We floated down the river about a mile, when we drifted among five or six men who were drowning. They broke my hold of the board, and I again thought I was lost, but fortunately I bobbed up by a long steerage pole. It was about twenty-five feet long. An Irishman, one of the boat hands, was on one end of it. I was carried along on it very nicely going downstream. I said to him, "'Let us steer for the shore. We can use our limbs and may get into a treetop.' We landed on the Arkansas shore, as I afterwards learned, and remained there till about seven o'clock a.m. A steamer came up from Memphis and sent a skiff out to us, and we, almost naked, were taken to the steamer and afterwards to Memphis. Some citizens gave me a pair of shoes and five dollars in our money. They treated me as kindly as anyone could. I went to the quartermaster's department and drew a dry suit of clothes. I had lost all but shirt and pants when in the water, and with what the citizens gave me I was now fitted out. I stayed in Memphis about two weeks, and met my friend Everman, who was very glad to see me. We were afraid to try the boats again, and waited for the train to go north. We received word that they would not run any train for several weeks. We were too anxious to get home to wait any longer, so we again tried the water. This time we succeeded in getting to Cairo, Illinois. Here I boarded a train for Indianapolis. At Terre Haute we were given a grand dinner, and I began to think I was in God's country again. We then proceeded on our way to Indianapolis, and received a furlough for thirty days. When the time was up, I went back and was honorably discharged, June twentieth, 1865. My present occupation is trader and stock buyer. Present post office address, Romney, Indiana. End of section 46《Section 47 of Loss of the Sultana》by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Section 47. Ogilvy E. Hamblin. I am a resident of Pulaski Township, Jackson County, Michigan, and am now fifty years old, March 1892. I enlisted in the United States Army at Jackson, Michigan, in 1863, as a private in Company E of the 2nd Regiment, Michigan Cavalry, and went from Jackson to Grand Rapids, Michigan, thence to Nashville, Tennessee, and there we drilled for regular service until February 1864. Thence we went to Cleveland, Tennessee, to join our regiment. We did not see much actual service until May 5, 1864, when we started with Sherman for Atlanta. We went as far as Kennesaw and Lost Mountain, and then turned our horses over to Cook's command, and came back to Nashville to guard the Nashville and Franklin Railroad until Atlanta was taken. We then drew horses and drilled at Franklin until Forrest came back in Sherman's rear and crossed the Tennessee River. We were then sent to drive him back again. After driving him back we were ordered to guard the river to keep Hood from crossing, our company being sent to Raccoon Ford, where Hood was attempting to cross. 
there was a small engagement took place there when our cavalry was surrounded and all taken prisoners i being so unfortunate as to get shot through the arm near the shoulder this was on the thirtieth day of october eighteen sixty four they took me from raccoon ford to florence alabama and there for practice the young rebel doctors cut off my arm i think it could have been saved they kept me in the hospital at florence until the first of december when hood again commenced moving toward nashville then i was sent to columbus mississippi to the rebel hospital and as soon as i was able i was sent to cahaba prison alabama where i remained until they sent me to jackson mississippi thence to vicksburg where i boarded the steamer sultana and then went up to memphis tennessee and while they were unloading some sugar at memphis my chum frank perkins and i spread down our blankets took off our top clothes all but our shirts and drawers and were soon in the hand of slumbers dreaming of battlefields and of all the scenes which we had passed through when we were suddenly awakened by a terrific explosion i sprang to my feet only to find the whole boat in a tremendous tumult and uproar the cries of the dying and the groans of the wounded and the loud appeals for help were heartrending. the hold of the boat was full of comrades they cried for the door of the hold to be opened my chum frank perkins and i pulled the door away when they came rushing out of the hold like bees out of a hive followed by dense clouds of steam and smoke i remained on board the boat until the fire and steam drove me off i then looked the situation over calmly and thinking that my underclothes would be a hindrance to me while in the water i took every stitch of my clothing off as coolly as though about to take a bath which proved to be of considerable duration the water was already full of the seething mass of humanity some were swimming boldly toward the shore others going down to rise no more some were clasping and dragging down to death those who could have saved themselves had they been left unencumbered all in all it was a terrible sight to behold and one from which i shrink and shudder to this day nor do i ever wish to witness such a sight again screwing my courage up to the sticking point i prepared to take the leap into the icy waters which i expected to be my sepulchre i watched my chance for a clear spot so that no one would catch on to me and drown me at once into the water and when i arose to the surface i struck out as best i could having but one arm to swim with i found i could do nothing against the strong current and so let myself float down with the current after floating for some time i came across my old chum frank perkins again and three other fellows on a plank they asked me to get on but the plank would not hold all of us up so i put my arm on his back to rest myself and floated along then i struck out again when behold a welcome object was in sight some trees on an island i floated into a treetop and caught fast with my arm and shouted for help when nearly exhausted some woodsmen heard me and came to my rescue with a boat they took me to their shanty i never was as cold in all my life i shook until i thought i would shake their shanty down the steamer blew up between one and two o'clock and i was rescued just before daylight i could not tell the distance we floated down the river nor the length of time we were in the water but it seemed a long time and i do not want another bath like it the united states steamer pocahontas came up the river and picked us up and took us back to memphis it was quite embarrassing for me when i got off the boat onto the wharf i was still in the same condition as when i leaped into the water entirely naked when we reached the warehouse the united states sanitary commission gave me a pair of red drawers and undershirt when i felt comparatively happy i was then taken to the soldiers home at memphis and there fitted out with a full suit and cared for like a human being 
I remained there three days and was then taken to Columbus, Ohio, thence to Detroit and from there to Jackson, the place of beginning. As I look back over the past, mine was an experience which I would not want to go through again. I am now comfortably situated, but am almost totally blind and expect, ere this is published in book form, to be shut entirely out from the light of day which I can trace back to poor vaccination and exposure while undergoing the above-written sufferings. End of section 47 Section 48 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 48 Robert N. Hamilton I enlisted in the service of the United States on the ninth day of July, 1862, at Huntsville, Scott County, Tennessee. I was a private in Company F of the 3rd Regiment of Tennessee Cavalry, and was captured at Athens, Alabama on the 24th of September, 1864, and confined in Cahaba Prison, Alabama, and released from there about the 12th of March, 1865. About two o'clock in the morning of April 27, 1865, the explosion of the Sultana occurred, and every deck was covered with sleeping soldiers. I was sleeping with Corporal H. C. Jones of my company on the boiler deck, about midway between the boilers and the stern of the boat. The noise awoke me. I thought that I would be crushed to death by the falling timbers, but I soon found that the boat was on fire. I began to make preparations for my escape. I first went toward the stern of the boat, but everywhere was confusion. Men and women were praying, and most of them not thinking of trying to save their lives. They were leaping off into the water on top of each other, hundreds drowning together. I saw that was not the place for me to make my escape, so I turned around and went back to about the center of the boat and got a thin board about six inches wide and about ten feet long, and went out through the wheelhouse, climbed down on the wheel, and got off into the water without sinking. Soon after I got into the water, someone got hold of my board. I spoke to him to let go of it, as it was not sufficient for both of us, but I had to jerk it away from him. I then heard Buck Leonard exclaim, "'Is that you, Bob?' I told him it was." He said, "'Don't get excited and you'll get out.' I thought he was taking things rather cool, as he had on all of his clothes, even to his hat and boots. He got out alive, and I reckon is living today. I still held on to my board and swam for some time, but did not seem to be getting very far from the old wreck, which had, in a very short time, burned down to the boiler deck. I suppose I had been in the water something near one hour when I saw a steamboat going down the river. I started toward it, as I thought it would stop to pick us up, but it kept on going. I had got back nearer the burning wreck. Seeing several of the boys had got back on the bow of the boat, I swam to where one of the spars was lying with one end in the water and the other end on the bow of the wreck. I climbed it and got back on the bow, where I, together with about twenty others, was taken to land by two citizens on the Arkansas side of the river. After getting back on the old wreck, I met Thomas Pangle of my company and saw the bodies of three men that were burned beyond recognition and helped to pull a man up on the boat. He was one of the engineers. His nose was torn off, all except a small particle of skin, and he died before he was taken to land. It was now about sunrise. The hull sank soon after the last load was taken off. The two men that rescued us brought ashore the bodies of two dead women, mother and daughter, who were of a family of about eight persons, all of whom were drowned except a grown son who was frantic with grief at the sight of his dead mother and sister. A boat soon came to our relief. 
Tom Pangle and I found Jarson M. Elliott of our company on the boat. He was scalded all over and unable to help himself, but was perfectly composed and bore his suffering with great fortitude. He had his army badge, which he requested me to give to his parents. He died that night in Gayoso Hospital, Memphis, Tennessee. Next day I met my brother John and several more of our company. My brother Henry was lost with about twenty others of the company. About the twenty-ninth of April we were again started north and landed at Cairo, Illinois, where we took the cars for Mattoon, Illinois. On arriving at Mattoon, we were met by the citizens of the surrounding country with wagon loads of provisions, the best that the country afforded. The vast multitude manifested their sympathy for us through speeches made by chosen orators. Never shall I forget seeing the tears shed by the stoutest hearts on that occasion. We then went to Camp Chase, Ohio, where we remained a short time. Eventually, all the paroled prisoners were ordered to their respective states to be mustered out of the service by General Order No. 77. I was discharged from the service of the United States on the 10th of June, 1865, at Nashville, Tennessee. Thus ended nearly three years of hard service which I gave my country, and of which I feel proud today. All I regret is that I could not do more for my country. I try to teach my children the importance of honoring our country and its glorious old flag. God bless it, may it wave over a free country as long as time may last. My present post office address, Van Alstyne, Grayson County, Texas. End of section 48《セクション49》of《Loss of the Sultana》by Chester D. Berry。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。セクション49》Absalom N. Hatch。I was born in Steuben County, New York, March 8, 1839. Enlisted at Saginaw, Michigan, November 11, 1861. Company F, First Regiment, Michigan Engineers and Mechanics was captured near Huntsville, Alabama, May 5, 1864, and confined in a prison at Cahaba, Alabama, also at Marion, Mississippi. I was put on board the Sultana, too weak to care what became of me, but the air from the river, with the sweet crackers and other dainties provided by the ladies, seemed to put new life into me. I began to realize that I was on my way home after a prison life of ten and one-half months. On the night of the disaster I did not lie down until the boat loosed from her moorings at the coal barge near midnight, and then found that some comrade had occupied my place, or rather the one that I had selected, on the boiler deck. There was no other way than to find another, a task easier thought of than accomplished but which I proceeded to do. I first explored the boiler deck, then cabin and hurricane decks, but all were full. I then went below and out in front of the boilers, near the flagstaff on the bow, and rolled myself up in a blanket between coils of rope. Had just gone to sleep when the explosion occurred. Several men ran over me and jumped into the river before I could get on my feet. I stayed on the boat until the wheel, or covering, on the left-hand side began to topple into the boat, when I jumped in the river with an oak scantling, two by four, for company, floated within three miles of Memphis, and was finally picked up by a boat just at peep of day. The sight while on the boat, previous to leaving it, brings a shudder even to this late day. P.S. Yours found me just attacked with erysipelas, wrote off what you found on this sheet. The next morning both eyes were swollen shut, have just got around again. Would have written more if I had been well. Present occupation is that of farming. Post office address, Ellington, Tuscola County, Michigan. End of section 49